Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending September 10th. First up, I would like to give a shout out and a reply to Katie Brewer, 1966. She had a very good comment and I would like to address that. How did the polar bears get white just by interbreeding? Actually, in the first place, polar bears are not white. Their hair actually is clear looking like glass tubes. And at one time there was a theory that their hair actually acted like fiber optic tubes and conducted light and in the same way conducted some kind of heat down to their skin. But a physicist named Daniel W. Kuhn of St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York in 1988 proved that to be false after doing various tests. The amount of light transmission through the hair in the way uh, optical fiber tubes do it was just very, very minute and not enough to make any kind of difference whatsoever. But as far as the reason why they've got the light coloring and the reflection, when you do have clear hair, it does provide reflectivity of the light all around, and the different colors of light blend together to give an appearance of white. The reason being is because of the fact, well, this is the, the best theory going on right now, is that they had, during the last ice age, they had predators um, chasing them out of the regions that they lived further south up into the northern regions and for reasons of camouflage and also being able to stalk their prey, the lighter colored of the bears usually ended up with a better survival advantage to the darker colored bears and as they got lighter and lighter they eventually had transparent fur which gave them the white appearance. And as far as the interbreeding goes, there's another theory that as the polar bears interbred with brown bears and in the case of my last week's article, the Irish brown bears, there was a lot of hybrids produced and those hybrids that were the wrong color for the region such as white hybrids on the bears that are further south or brown hybrid bears of those further north would have a lower survival rate too so they would not survive long enough to reproduce and be able to have babies so the colors would naturally still tend towards being lighter colored in the north and darker colored in the south and there's also a little bit of theories too as to the uh, structure of the dentures and the jaw structure and being able to feed in the different regions because of the different types of prey. But that's the, the basic answer I can give and I'll give a reference to this from polarbearsinternational.org. Second up, a friend of mine, Huachuca guy, sent me a video. I love these kind of videos. It's uh, the Mythbusters style where he tests snake repellents. He actually himself has a business, uh, snake avoidance training for dogs business that he runs himself and it seems to be very a very competent snake handler especially with some of the more venomous types of snakes and he's testing a snake repellent called Dr. T's Snake Away uh, along with another repellent of his own formulation which seems to be even stronger than the Dr. T's Snake Away. There's uh, three types of rattlesnakes that he uses for these tests. Three species of rattlesnakes and one called a common desert king snake. I'm not going to give away the results. I'm going to let the video speak for itself. So down below, as usual, in the description, you'll see the link to the video. Please check it out because he does a very good uh, method of testing this with various snakes and repeatability, too. So um, the one thing I will say about it, too, is these types of things always, for me, are a point of concern because if something like a snake or a shark repellent doesn't work as advertised, people can get hurt and even killed. So to me, it is very important that these things work as advertised. But yeah, check out Wachuca Guy's video down below. It's, uh, it's really great. Next up, this is uh, an action and sports type of camera in the market. A lot of people have been talking about the Drift, the new Drift HD and also the GoPro camera and they've been competing with each other, adding features to try to um, compete with each other and get people to buy either or of those cameras but also there's a third player that people often forget about and that's Contour and they're not by any means out of the game. They've come up with a new camera called the Contour Roam and it's a waterproof camera. It's a uh, waterproof to one meter, which to me it would be more, instead of waterproof, I would probably call it water resistant or splash resistant, but anyway, that's um, what they call it. The nice thing about it is they've got a really good price point for it. It's $200 as compared to the other contour cameras that are in the $300 and $500 range. Um, some of the pluses for the camera, it's got uh, instant on recording, which is very nice. You turn it on and it starts recording. It's made with an aluminum body. 
Um, the part about being waterproof to one meter, um, I'd still consider that a plus because it's, it makes it basically splash proof and if you were to use it on a bicycle or a motorcycle, um, to me that would be pretty much rain proof. I guess they are eventually going to come out with a housing too so you can take it down further. Um, definitely not waterproof enough to be scuba diving with, not for one meter until you get the housing. Some of the minuses I would say, um, non-removable battery and no external mic. Um, that always concerns me when a camera does not have a used or replaceable battery. Uh, even in the $200 price range, for most people that's far from a disposable camera. So I think uh, a removable, user replaceable battery would definitely be a plus, but it does not have that. I'll give you the link. This article's from Engadget. And also if you go down to the bottom and look at the source, you can click on that and you go to the Contour website and you get a view of the comparison of all three Contour cameras at the different price ranges. And last up, this is from fastcompany.com. This is not a totally original idea. I've seen it before in magazines like Popular Science or Popular Mechanics. But this 22-year-old inventor, Maxwell von Stein, has come up with a pretty practical version of installing a flywheel into a bicycle, a regular pedal bike, to be able to recover when you do braking. I don't know if it also works and recovers the... Uh, I'm concerned about, too, when you, uh, if you can recover the energy from going downhill. A lot of my routes I take when I ride a bicycle, there's certain portions of them that are downhill, and if I can recover even 50% of uh, the energy from going downhill um, of gravity and start it into the flywheel, I think that would also gain some momentum from either going up the next hills or accelerating from a stop. Um, he mounts a small 15-pound flywheel to boost the speed and take the load off his legs while pedaling on this particular bike. There's, uh, besides the article, there's also a video included in this. Um, I think just because of the fact that he has uh, put this together in a, a product that may actually be good enough to make it to market, maybe a plus even with it not being totally original. So if you get a chance, check out his idea. I think it's very good. So anyway, that's my articles for this week. Take care, everybody, and I will catch you next week.